So we just got done looking at rates of reactions and how we can start to quantify the relationship of how quickly our reactants are changing into our products. Our next step, our next piece of that puzzle is actually thinking about how we go about describing a reversible process. And this is a little bit new for us. Typically when we think of reactions, they just go and then they're done. But that isn't actually true. When we have these fast reactions or these reactions with very low activation energies, as some of our reactants are forming products, just mathematically speaking, some of our products change back into reactants. So, so now all of a sudden we have this kind of, this two-way street where we've got two different reactions kind of vying to compete to see which one can happen quicker. Well, not really the case, but it's a nice way to think about these, what we call reversible reactions. And so we need to make a distinction. We need to make a clear distinction between when we say kinetics versus equilibrium, what it is we are describing, because there's gonna be some terms that get used that are similar for both. Uh, kinetics specifically, is looking at the speed of the reaction. How quickly are the concentrations of products appearing or reactants disappearing per unit of time? We just got done with that. Kinetics is all about the speed, the rate of the reaction. Equilibrium is looking at the extent of that reaction. Does it always go all the way to products? Does it actually make all of the stuff we're trying to make or does some of it stay as the reactants based upon activation energies and where we're seeing our final kind of concentrations to be at? We've never really looked at it in this lens. Typically we just say, okay, how much stuff did we make? But that's not technically the case. And there's lots of examples of reactions where this becomes more important as we look at kind of competing or, or, or dual level reactions. So equilibrium applies to the extent of the reaction, the concentration of the product that has appeared after an unlimited time of a uh, reaction has occurred or until no further change occurs. Now it's not technically true. Change is still happening. It's just we're no longer seeing a measurable difference in equilibrium. Essentially what's happening is as reactants make products, our products are reacting back into those reactants at equal and opposite rates. And so there is a relationship between them. We say that at equilibrium, your rate forward, the rate at which your reactants are changing into products is equal to the reverse rate or the rate at which the products are changing back into the reactants. And it's really nice to think about our straws, our, our little mini lab that we just kind of finished up today. When we think about kind of the rates of our reactions and how we get to this point where no further change has occurred, but we're still moving the water, there's just no more measurable or observable change. They cancel each other out in a sense that they are opposite but equal. Cool. So given this, given that we're, we're saying at equilibrium, our rates are equal, we can start to do a little bit of uh, a little bit of calculating, a little bit of math. Uh, just a little bit more on equilibrium here. A systematic equilibrium is dynamic on the molecular level. We don't see any big macroscopic changes anymore, but that's because they're being balanced in either direction. The change, and here's the key, the change is still happening. It's just opposite and equal. That's the dynamic part. Even though you can't see it, it's still happening. A good example of this is the CO2 in your soda pop. You can reach a point where there's a pressure above. It's vapor pressure, right? Vapor pressure has a dynamic equilibrium. Your sealed soda pop, you've got a pressure of CO2 up top. You got CO2 still in the solution. If one comes out, another goes back into solution. And so they're opposite but equal. Until you change our pressure system and all of a sudden we've disrupted the equilibrium and that's where we're heading. Now we can start to see what change occurs to that system now that we've kind of had that change occur. Uh, here's a good example for you, hydrogen and iodine changing into hydroiodic acid. Uh, we can actually plot the change in their concentrations. We did that with our rates. And so our blue and our red represent our reactants. We started with some of those. We didn't have any product, hydroiodic acid at the beginning. And over time, we use up our reactants. We make some products. Now you'll notice we didn't use up all of the reactants. There's still some left over. And we didn't make all product. There's some not being formed, but you'll notice we reached this point where we have a flat line. We saw this again in that little mini lab. When your concentrations start to uh, uh, taper off or flat line, that means yes, they're still changing, but they're changing at opposite and equal rates. There's no change in the measured molarities or concentrations because they're opposite and equal. So say when we start to see that tapering off or that flat line that we've established the equilibrium, we're no longer seeing a change because those rates are opposite. Cool. Uh, another example here, just to be thinking about this, we're gonna talk more about K's here in just a second, but it's good to introduce this with what we're kind of thinking about. Um, so sometimes you'll hear the term reactant favored versus product favored for a reaction. We typically look at highly uh, product favored reactions because otherwise it would be 
boring. You'd make some stuff and nothing really would happen. Ah. And so we typically are looking at kind of the right hand example here, but it's worth noting that there are kind of two scenarios or two situations you can start to see. If something is reactant favored, we say that this kind of italicized K, more on that here in just a second, is less than one. And, and really when we say equilibrium constant, it is just a number. That number tells us for this reaction, do we expect to see a lot of products or do we expect to see lots of reactants? It's kind of a gauge or a tool we can use to just think about, I'm gonna mix this stuff. What do I expect to see happen? And we can then plan accordingly for our reaction. If it's reactant favored, you'll notice that most of our substance stays as a reactant. We see very few products being created. Most of it stays in its original form. If it's product flavored, flavored. If it's product favored, most of our reactants get used up and we have lots of product form. Now, again, we're still reaching equilibrium when our lines start to flatline or our slope approaches zero. We say we've reached equilibrium. We have opposite and equal rates. And so we've reached kind of that K value. More on that here to come. Cool. If we're thinking about the particles, if our reaction was blue turning to red, well, only one of them changed. This would be reactant favored. We say it's a small K. If most of our orange change to that light green. We say it's a large K. We have more products than reactants. We say it's a large equilibrium constant. An intermediate K would be like one. And I think we saw that in the lab for the first example where our reactants and our products approached kind of the same value as we think about our lines graphically for our measured concentrations or our volumes as it was in the lab. And so we can kind of start to think about what this value means in terms of what we see in the in our lab. Uh, cool, on the macroscopic level, sorry. On the macroscopic level, we actually kind of just wait. We wait until we don't see any more change. And so here we had our N2O4, so dinitrogen tetraoxide. And over time, it is a unimolecular reaction. It will break apart, split apart into two nitrogen dioxides. Well, nitrogen dioxide is a colored substance. It's got more of a deep kind of burnt auburn color. And so actually over time, we can see that until it no longer changes colors, at which point we know we've reached equilibrium. We've made as much product as we're going to, and now we're opposite and equal, and equilibrium has been established. So typically we go until we don't see a change happening anymore. Cool, let's talk about K. So usually, typically it's a large italicized K, different from the little K. Little K was the rate constant from our kinetics unit. Uh, little K, we know had all these units. Big K, mm -mm, ain't got them. If your rate forward equals your rate reverse, that means we can kind of take whatever those reactants rate is, set them equal to the products rate, the reverse rate, and set those two things equal to each other. Well, if they're equal, then kind of we say that we can make a proportion. And that's really what we do. We say, okay, um, we're going to call K forward divided by K reverse. That becomes this value we call the equilibrium constant. It's just going to tell us are we favoring to make more products or are we favoring our reactant side? So really our equilibrium kind of constant, this K is the measure of the products that get formed times their coefficient. In this case, the N and the M actually mean coefficients. Um, you're not gonna like this. The textbook actually makes the assumption that for all of these kind of examples, they are all elementary steps. So we get to pull the coefficients right out for N and for M. And so we are gonna just be pulling the coefficients for the exponents for these types of calculations. So it's how many products you got raised to their coefficients over your reactants raised to their coefficients. And we'll look at an example here coming up, um, but it's, it's nice to think. And, and really all this is, is a proportion. It's a ratio. It tells us, do we get way more products made or way more reactants made? If you had lots of products, K is gonna be big. Got lots in the numerator, it's a large value. If you have lots of reactants, well then K is gonna be little. It's gonna be less than one. And so we see a value under one for our equilibrium constant. Uh, and so if we were gonna write this for the example we were just looking, here's our balanced equation. Our products was the hydroiodic. It's gonna be raised to the second power because its coefficient is a two. That's gonna be over the concentration of hydrogen times iodine, both raised to the first. And, and again, really we're just saying, based on the amounts we got, are we favoring reactants or products? That's really what our equilibrium constant tells us. And once we get comfortable with this idea of finding this constant based on the data in the lab, then we can start to talk about how we can shift it, how we can make it do what we want. Because again, that's where we're at. We're trying to control the reaction and get it to do what we want it to do. And again, if K is greater than one, we say that it's product favored, we got more numerator. If K is less than one, it is reactant favored. Feel free to pause, a few more time on the slide. Uh, cool. Uh, so in an equilibrium constant expression, 
uh, our concentrations are reported as equilibrium values, not what they started with, but what did you have after the reaction has occurred? And usually that we need some way to measure that. We'll look at a lab coming up a little bit later on that. Uh, your products are in numerator, reactants are in the denominator. Uh, each concentration is raised to its stoichiometric balancing coefficients. So we're just putting the coefficients in based on the balanced equation. And our values on this K are dimensionless. There's no units. It's just a number. It's just a ratio. It's just a value to tell us whether we expect to see more products or reactants formed. For our particular reaction, our, our K is specific to a temperature. We know that different things react differently at different temperatures. We'll talk more about that. Uh, hopefully saw some of that on those handouts when we think about endo versus exothermic, what changing the temperature will do as we kind of look at those examples. We'll follow up on that when I see you again in class. Cool, uh, so let's just write a couple. Um, so here we've got two examples. One is gaseous, the other is in an aqueous solution. And so it's worth noting there's a couple different ways we can write kind of this equilibrium expression. I'm going to disappear for just a second. Uh, and so as we're looking here, oh, beep, beep. Not all of our reactants and products are going to be included. If it's solid or liquid water, we do not include them in our expression because they're not really going to change their concentrations very much or significantly. They, they don't change on a measurable amount. And so we do not include them in our K value. Uh, the other piece is sometimes we're looking at concentration. So then we'd have a KC, yeah, go KC. I mean, uh, equilibrium concentration, KC. And then we've got a KP. KP is when we are working with pressures. And so if we're gonna look at the two examples kind of over here to the left, we can kind of think about how we'd go about writing these. The process is the same. It's just whether or not you're looking at the product, or sorry, pressures or your aqueous solutions. So just for practice here, um, if we wanted to write, we would write a KP for this first one because we're dealing with gases. The solid doesn't get included because it's not really going to change appreciably or measurably. Uh, so products, we'd have SO2, and sometimes I'll do parentheses with a little P, and that's going to be over our O2 raised to its kind of in its pressure. So we would just write same expression, still products of reactants. Both the coefficients here are one, so we don't have to actually put a value in there. Um, but we usually do parentheses to indicate it's not the concentration. For example, here, pause for a second, you try. Cool. If you want to check it, uh, reminder, we don't do our pure liquids. It's not going to really change. Water doesn't get incorporated here. We are going to look at KC because we're working with aqueous solutions. We can actually measure molarity. So we would have in brackets NH4 plus raised to the first. And that's going to be times our hydroxide, OH minus, also raised to the first. So products over our reactants. In this case, it was the um, dissolved ammonia NH3 concentration, also an implied one there. Cool. So this is just how we go about writing these equilibrium constants. Uh, it's just products of reactants. And then if there were stoichiometric values, we would just raise them to those powers. But for this one, we did not have to worry about it because it was all one one. It was like it's an introduction or something. Cool. Well, coming on back, we'll talk about how to start to use these ex equilibrium expressions to actually find values or think about what we're going to expect. Um, it's going to be a little math heavy for that next couple of, uh, uh, next couple of uh, sessions, um, but you guys are also math savvy. I anticipate you pick it up incredibly, incredibly quickly. Uh, cool. If you've got questions, bring them on back. We'll talk about them in class.